Good morning, everyone. Um, today, this morning, we're going to have a conversation, more like a discussion, on critical thinking. Um, it's going to be you learning from us and us learning from you. Because I believe that um, even though this is one of the most crucial parts of strategic leadership, I also believe that it's one of the least explored and understood parts of, of strategic leadership. And so I will start by talking a little bit about what I think and others think critical, leader, critical thinking is, um, spend some time on why this is important for Africa and for Africa's security sector in particular, and then explore some elements of critical thinking and then close with a few um, implications and recommendations. Um, but before we start, uh, do we have any supporters of Manchester United in the... I'm you. Manchester hey, United. On. I know it's difficult, it has been difficult for you this season, but yeah. you know you have to own your club, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, why were people really, really, you know, anxious to see Jose Moreno leave Manchester United. The, the thing is, we had one of the richest football clubs in the history of football. He had all the resources he wanted. He had one of the best teams assembled ever. He had the star from the last World Cup, Paul Pogba. But any time you saw Manchester United play last season, it's as if there was no thinking about the format or the structure of the team. So even though you had a manager who had won many trophies in the past, even though you had a team that was well-resourced and skilled, it was very difficult to understand how they would win anything last season. And unsurprisingly, they didn't. And as a Liverpool supporter, it gives me great pleasure to be yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, I knew that's where you're coming. But the important issue here is, as we think about African security sector, those issues are also at play. The issue of capacity. What sort of team do we have? The issue of resources and resourcing. The issue of strategy. But most important is the issue of critical thinking in terms of defining how a group of people, and in this case the security sector, moves towards a common objective. That is where critical thinking comes in. And it's been variously defined. Um, one definition is that it's an intellectually disciplined process. And as Matt said, it's about conceptualizing, analyzing, gathering information. But it is an intellectually disciplined process that guides action. There has to be a relationship between the critical thinking that you do and the end product, the action. I think that's something we're going to come back to in a, in, 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 in a bit. Second important thing is that um, a researcher at, uh, who um, published at the Harvard Business Review describes critical thinking as a learned skill. Just because you are smart doesn't make you a critical thinker. Let me say this again. Just because you are smart does not make you a critical thinker. Critical thinking is something that you learn and that you can learn. And hopefully today we're going to go through some of the key um, ways in which we could learn how to be critical thinkers in Africa's um, security sector. Let me um, go to um, General, um, uh, US uh, General uh, Martin Dempsey. How did he describe strategic leaders. He said, there are people who must be able to think critically. And in thinking critically, develop 
creative solutions to complex problems. So the whole reason why you have to be able to do critical thinking and do it well is because you are the ones at various stages who are going to have the responsibility not just to lead change, but also to manage change. So let's go back to this. It's about an intellectually disciplined process, we've said that, to actively think through, analyze, and evaluate information. So we're going to have a number of question sessions in this, um, during this um, hour and a half. The first question is, what sort of information does an African security sector professional or leader like yourself, <coughs> what sort of information do you need to gather that should, that should guide your action? Okay, thank you. Um, being able to um, have action that adds value. So what sort of information about what do you need? Information about groups, information about the economy, about politics, about security, what sort of information? Negative forces, okay, we'll talk about that later. Anything else? Since most people see um, um, economic issues as a cause, you might want to have information about poverty, right? Okay, I'm going to uh, draw a line on this. We're going to come back to this conversation. So everybody who had their hands up, you'll still have an opportunity to talk. The, the reason why we're doing this exercise about what sort of information is twofold. Firstly, because the kind of information you require in South Africa is going to be different from what my friend in Abidjan is going to need. Second, insecurity in Africa is not about just one thing. It's about a lot of things that are interrelated. So when I said I agree with you partially, yes, food security might not be um, germane to everyone, but if you look at most of the food riots in North Africa, it led to a lot of other things. And so my question for you is, how could you, as a uniformed or civilian security sector leader, understand information from all these different sources? How do you understand how external debt affects insecurity? or understand environmental stress and migration dynamics. Because for you to be a critical thinker, the definition, you have to be able to actively analyze and process all of this information. How do you do it? So I think what is clear from all your interventions and examples is that the information that you require to be critical thinkers is diverse. Mm -hmm. um, the sources are varied. It differs from country to country and from year to year. And so as you think about critical thinking, the collection, the analysis, um, and the conceptualization of these problems, I think we have to be really, really, really clear about the fact that because insecurity is so multidimensional in Africa, the fight against insecurity has to be collaborative. Those who understand health have to be able to talk to those who understand the economy or food security. Those who um, understand the um, groups or the negative forces have to be able to talk to the community leaders or the religious leaders. And so critical thinking <coughs> is not just 
one person in a room thinking on behalf of everybody else. It is the collective um, efforts to ensure that we understand how these various factors interplay and the extent to which it is. Critical thinking is not something that um, people in at the Harvard Business School or the Africa Center invented for other places to follow. I think there's a lot about critical thinking in African culture and African philosophy that lends itself to um, the continent as we think about, secu about security and insecurity. We had a very interesting conversation in, um, in um, Botswana recently about um, Ubuntu. Does anybody know what it means? I am because we are. If you break that down, what does it imply? How does that relate to critical thinking? Directly. Yeah. Directly. It's an African philosophy mm -hmm. that underpins critical thinking. So as you're thinking about how do we start thinking through um, ways to understand critical thinking, I think the first point is it's not an alien concept. It is ingrained in the African DNA. I am because we are is not just um, something that's a slogan. It's something that African countries and communities have practiced for centuries with great success. The problem started when we forgot that I am because we are. Yeah. When we said I am because I am. I am. <laughs> That's when we got into problems. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it um, critically across the continent, the more we could get the we are, the more we can get the various aspects of insecurity that we need around the table when we want to be critical thinkers. The collaborative um, 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 dimension that our sister from South Africa just you know, brilliantly explained. And so first point is it is not an alien concept. It is rooted in African philosophy. Second point is that Africa is dealing with some very, very challenging problems. And so business as usual will not work. Third is that the normal response, the reactionary response to insecurity across the continent is usually not driven by evidence. Or the way we design the responses is not driven by evidence. It's driven by um, a reaction or a knee-jerk reaction to issues. And the more we think about insecurity in Africa, the more I think we should be convinced that we need to have more evidence-driven um, responses to insecurity. And critical thinking affords us that, that opportunity. So we've talked about why it's important for Africa. It's in our philosophy, it's the nature of insecurity. Why in Africa's security sector? Because one, insecurity is multidimensional. Secondly, we are not fighting the insecurity of the past. Many of us who go to universities will read big books about strategy, about security, and then we, we have positions in various ministries. Our uniformed brothers and sisters go to war college, military academy, they learn about the art of war. But let's think about it. When we are addressing insecurity across the African continent, how many times do we need to fight wars? It's internal conflict that's the issue. And so we have to broaden our critical thinking prism to prepare for a multidimensional approach. Um, uh, US uh, Marine General, General Krulak, wrote a short paper called The Three Block War, and where he hypothesized that the security sector professional of the future has to him imagine himself or herself walking down the streets 
and walking down three blocks or going past three neighborhoods. In one neighborhood, you need to do traditional security, stop fighting. Other neighborhoods, you need to be a peacekeeper, keep, you know, police uh, things. In a third neighborhood, you need to be able to offer humanitarian response. Because if you look at all the data on insecurity in Africa, and we're going to have a, a session on Friday that's going to go into this into a bit more detail, what is clear is that violent conflict in Africa now is a lot more about politics, internal strife, and uh, civil unrest than it is about anything else. And so that's why we need to have you know, a more nuanced approach to our thought processes when it comes to this. And the last reason why I think it's important for Africa's security sector is that critical thinking enables us to utilize scarce resources more effectively and more efficiently. Because rather than spending a lot of money to buy an aircraft carrier, you can address the root causes of conflict. And that's not just a hypothetical statement. There was one African country that was hell-bent on buying an aircraft carrier. No. So critical thinking is what helps us go through um, this particular, uh, helps us um, go address this particular hurdle. So how do we do critical thinking? So we've talked a, little, a lot about the definitions and the context. How do we do it? The first is, First step, I'm going to go about, I'm going to go over three steps with you. The first step is understanding the problem. Understanding the problem. So, by showing hands, how many people know how to boil an egg? You know, if you don't know, that's fine. <laughs> when, when, I was in, when I was in graduate school, I actually burnt a boiled egg. Uh -huh. Yes, it, 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 it can happen. So yeah. why do we know how to, bo to boil an egg? Because if we know the menu, sorry, if we know the recipe mm -hmm. and we put the effort, can we will get a boiled egg 100 times out of 100, yeah. right? So if we say, the, in this case, the recipe, let's say we call it the R <laughs> plus the effort, I call it an SS, a simple solution. Because a simple problem is one that if you have a plan, you put forth the effort, 100 times out of 100, it will work. All right? And many times when we think about insecurity in Africa, that's our approach. Yeah. We have the riot police who will clear people so off, off, off the um, streets. Problem solved. If I ask you, how many people could build me a plane, an aircraft, from scratch? Show your hands. But if I told you that I'm going to give you a team of engineers, I'd give you all the money you need and all the um, parts that you need for the plane. How many people can build a plane? Yeah. Because... Uh, that's a complicated problem. Because if you take the SS, the simple problem, you add to that technical assistance plus additional resources equal complicated problem. Complicated solution. That's a complicated. It's like a simple problem because you need a plan, you need effort, but if you have a bit of skill, capacity, and some resources, you can solve it. Does that look like Africa's security problems? Yeah, no, 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 no. Because this is assuming that once you, somebody can give you a plan, 
all you need is technical assistance and more resources and to work. Mm -hmm. Does that plan relate to your problem? No. No. Because what does Africa have? Africa doesn't have a plan, doesn't have a problem that is simple. I don't have a problem that is simple that you can solve if you just have a bit more resources. Many times when we think about solutions, and during these three weeks we're going to you're going to go have a, you're going to have an exercise, you're going to have a simulation exercise as well. The first thing we think about is oh, if we only had more money and political will, we can solve the problem. But we don't really understand the problem because the problem might be food security or health. We're not trained in that area. We don't understand how health concerns influence economic inequality, influences moving people, migration, and inter internal displacement, and influences or can spark violence. We don't. So the complicated approach is one that many Africans, um, many African countries embrace. And um, because um, a donor or a partner might come and say, here, I'm going to give you 10 new trucks. Or I'm going to give you more training in this area, and you should be able to solve this. For the past 60 years, it has not worked. The next 60 years, it is not going to work. So what does Africa have? Africa is facing a complex problem. facing a complex problem. There is no, no set plan. The example that I usually give and a number of people give when they're describing a complex problem, it's like raising a child, a baby. Yeah. Even if you have five children, they're all different. They'll wake up at different times. They will like different foods. And you, as a parent, have to learn. Have to learn what they like, what they don't like, what, when they cry, when they don't cry. And so if you had a plan for your first child, you want to apply it to your next child, it probably wouldn't work. And same with insecurity. Because it is so complex and interlinked, it's not going to, there's no set plan. The second thing about a complex problem is that it is interlinked. So it's very difficult in the African context to say one issue caused this problem. It's difficult because one issue might have caused the violence, but the problem has many deep root, root causes. And if you're going to be effective as security sector leaders, you have to understand not just the breadth of insecurity, but that depth and how it is all intertwined. Um, so what we really, really need to um, look through is, this is a bad slide because it's going to be difficult for you to um, see a lot of it, but it kind of um, summarizes the conversation that we have been, we've been having, that when it comes to um, understanding the problem, we have to be able to think through how you get from point A to point B in your learning process. And once you learn, how do you apply that to um, the problem sets that you may have? Any uh, questions, comments before we go on? Uh, thank you so much. And no, you're not taking us back. I think you're reinforcing um, a key theme of these uh, three weeks. Um, if you forget everything we discuss over the next three weeks, one of the things we'd like you to be able to take with you is that you, as the next the emerging cadre of African leaders, you have agency to make change, and you have a responsibility to do it. And being able to do it effectively, it means thinking differently about problem sets and solutions. And 
our experience, our training, our societal norms don't always veer automatically towards critical thinking. And the point here is that to enable and empower you to do this, particularly given the broad range of um, the broad range of um, the broad range of uh, information that's um, going to come your way. One thing we haven't talked about is uh, cyber threats. That's a big thing for Africa. But how many people understand cyber threats or AI and how it's going to influence Africa? So, excellent point, but being able to process this really well and really does require us to approach thinking differently. Because like my dear friend, um, Jose Mourinho, former manager of Manchester United, um, he didn't change his thinking when he came to the club at a different time. And uh, we would also fa fail if we don't change our thinking with the times. And the critical thinking provides a great framework for us to, for us to do that. Any other questions? No, absolutely. Um, the um, conceptualization is basically a schematic to understand problem definition. And um, the agency to um, do a lot, a lot of these issues has a lot to do with um, political will. But it also has a, lo a lot to do with um, integrity. Um, because for many of us, the reality is that many of you work in situations where the political will does not always encourage and promote critical thinking. And so you're going to be swimming against the tide. And uh, I think we had some conversation about this yesterday, about how you, you keep your reputation clean and how you exercise integrity even though it may not always be um, in your um, benefit. As the gentleman was, this, was sharing his own personal story yesterday. Um, but I think that it's definitely something that we have to incorporate. But, um, uh, you know, and we have to recognize. Um, but it's not, but it, could, it could be either a positive, an enabler, or a hindrance, depending on the context. Uh, thank you so much. I think I should probably have um, let you talk through this slide <laughs> because everything you said <laughs> is basically in this slide and I liked uh, the way you, you ended talking about the organizational parochialism and also the appeals to tradition. These are things that are in opposition to critical thinking. Because critical thinking um, demands that, uh, firstly, we um, understand the problem, we inform and we, we, we describe. Secondly, we look at the issue a lot more closer and try to see how issues are connected and what influences the outcomes most um, um, what influence in, influences the outcome uh, most directly? Because you have direct and indirect uh, influences on the outcome. The third thing we need to do is exactly what you talked about, competing hypotheses. How do you negotiate and cooperate? Um, because in any problem set, and particularly a diverse um, problem set, you have the health people seeing it as important as the food security people, seeing it as important as the counterterrorism people, seeing it as important as the police. So how do you negotiate and cooperate so that you could have a strategy and an outcome that is desirable? Not one that addresses one constituency or the other, because critical thinking is about problem solving not about addressing one constituency or the other. After negotiating and uh, cooperating, you have to test and revise. 
because critical thinking is also about the evidence-driven part of your strategy. How do you ensure that what you're doing actually makes sense and is informed by the, all the data that you have collected? Because people could collect and analyze data and then go off and do something completely of the opposite. So in critical thinking, you need a step where you stop and you test it and you revise. Number five for me is the most important because once you have come through all of this, one through four, the critical thing becomes how do you then integrate what you, the outcomes of your critical thinking into your actual plans? And then how do you adapt? Because as we learned this afternoon, and as you already know, there's a lot of evolution and dynamism in Africa's security sector. Things change every day. So how do you adapt your strategy, your thinking, as the environment um, evolves? And that is where you come up against what the uh, gentleman rightly pointed out, and there are many other issues in this regard, but this organizational parochialism, a lack of political will, the appeal to, to um, tradition. Uh, in psychology, they call it path dependency, because it's always been done this way, therefore you automatically do it. But as you analyze it, what are the outcomes um, that you um, are likely to um, get? There, there are a number of people at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School um, who have thought through how you do this practically. It's, uh, it's, a, sim it's a similar um, dynamic where you have, you start by identifying the problem and the steps. You then take action. Um, once you've taken action, you, re you have to have time to reflect and to see the extent to which you're going where you um, intend. And then you have what they call step four, which is an iteration check. You ask yourself, have I made progress? If you have, you can move on to the next step. If you have not, you then apply what you learned um, in stage three to the process and you start again. Because in many ways, you don't always get the answer to difficult problems the first time you try. Just as you don't always learn what kind of food your new baby likes the first time. You have to try. If they don't like it, you try something else. And in our minds, from a security sector perspective, we have to be constantly churning the information, constantly re-evaluating, and constantly feeding all of this back into the way we think through um, this issue. So, as I said in the beginning, critical thinking is a learned skill. It's not something you can do just because you're smart or just because somebody um, uh, mentioned it. It's something you learn to do over time. It is costly in terms of time, and resources. But why should you invest time and resources in critical thinking? I think you, you, you invest in critical thinking because you want to have more useful, a, a more useful understanding of insecurity in your own country as it's dynamic and as it evolves. You want to have practitioners who are focused on the problem, not on a number of um, distractions. You want to have improved coordination, and you want to have goals that are realistic. And by realistic goals, I don't just mean goals that you can accomplish, but goals that actually solve the problem that you're looking at. And uh, this, if we're able to do this, we're going to be able to, we are going to impact policy, practice, and capacity in our security sector.
in specific ways and hopefully promote sustainable security, resilient societies, robust institutions, and accountable security sector governance. Uh, thank you.